Fire burns, it hurts, it can destroy. Fire also gives warmth and light. The coming of Christ is both a day of judgment and a day of promise. Two candles flickering brightly help us remember that the coming of Christ has many meanings. Steadfast love and faithful love will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. Light two candles, see them glow brightly so that all may know how two candles show the way, making our darkness bright as God's day. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. Dear God, we have much to do, and we are not sure we will be ready for the day of your coming. In Advent's light, help us to see what is important, to be who you want us to be, and to do what you would have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, I love Christmas. Christmas is... Uh, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm still a kid at heart. I, I hope that you can still be a kid at heart, because once you quit being a kid at heart, uh, you're just an old adult, that's all it is. So uh, try to try to in, enjoy the wonder of things, and, and for me, Christmas is one of those. How many of you have been listening to Christmas music since before Thanksgiving? All right, how many of you have been listening to Christmas music since before Halloween? How many of you have been listening to Christmas music since September? Okay, yeah. I, I remember one summer when I, uh, Lynn and I lived on Martha's Vineyard uh, when I was in seminary for a summer, and I worked in the warehouse as well as drove a delivery truck delivering to uh, restaurants and so forth for a food delivery, and I would play Christmas music out in the warehouse because there were times when I was the only one out there, and it was a hot summer that summer, and I thought, this makes it feel just a little bit better, a little bit cooler. So I'm, I'm one of those crazies. I, I understand that. Remember Christmases from your childhood. In fact, think back to some of the gifts that you were given. I, this has been kind of a fun exercise for me. I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, different things. Uh, for, for instance, where my families live. You know that I'm from a military family, and we lived all over the place. Now, some people would look at that as awful, terrible. I actually liked it. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the different places that we lived. Uh, we always made friends wherever we went. Um, there were five of us kids for one thing, so wherever we went, we already had playmates. Kind of force you to play with each other, I guess, but, uh, but we had that. And, and I kind of liked living in different places. Well, I, the first Christmas that I, that I can really remember anything about was when we were living in Nebraska. We actually lived on the border of Nebraska and Iowa. And um, I remember we lived in two different places there, but I remember we lived in this big house. It was, a, it was a huge house in town. It had a nice wraparound porch. It was one of those beautiful old ones. And the only thing I remember about Christmas there is that my sister and I, I remember I'm a twin, my sister and I got tricycles that Christmas. And we were in kindergarten, Head Start, right in that area. And I remember we had a track in our house that went around from the dining room to the kitchen, back around through the hallway and into the living room. And we just rode and rode and rode. Now, I can't remember if mom and dad or any of my other brothers got mad at us for doing it. But I remember we loved it. We, we were riding. So that was one of the first Christmas gifts that I can actually still remember. Uh, we then, from there, we went to Hawaii. And we spent a number of Christmases in Hawaii. And by the way, they love Christmas in Hawaii, and they truly dream of snow. You know, when they sing songs like I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, uh, they really mean it. Now, you could go to the Big Island and go up into the mountains, and they have snow up there. So you can actually go see snow in Hawaii if you wanted. I never got to the Big Island, but uh, we always enjoyed it. Now, as far as gifts there, for some reason, as far as a personal gift goes, the only gift I remember from our Christmases in Hawaii was actually one of my brother's gifts, probably because I really liked it and I thought it'd be cool to have. They had this little set where it was a, like a circle and they had uh, a little landing pad. Um, I, I would be willing to turn it off, but I, I want to get the recording. Should I turn it off? Yep, we'll do that. We'll, we'll hope that this one picks us up pretty good. 
I remember in Hawaii, they had, anyway, he had this little airplane and they would hold the controls and the airplane would fly around and actually take off and it would keep going in a circle and then you could land on that little landing strip. It was only about five feet wide, so I'm not talking like a, like a stringed airplane you'd fly outside. But I remember that one. But there is another gift, though, that I remember that was really for our whole family. Since we were in the military, we didn't get to see family very often, my grandparents on my dad's side or my mom's side. And I remember Grandma Wagner every year would send us a gift uh, for our whole family. She'd send a box, and in that box, every year it was the same thing. My mom and my sister each got a pair of white gloves, and my dad and my brothers and I each got a pair of black socks for, like, dress socks. Now, that's, not, that's the equivalent of receiving coal in your stockings, right? Coal actually was a good thing. It, it was good. You needed coal, but it just wasn't a lot of fun. Well, the same thing with those. Uh, we needed those things even though they weren't a lot of fun. But you know what? That made an impression on me. I can still remember getting those black socks. And I can, I can remember wearing them, like the church or what have you. Um, again, not, a, not the most exciting of gifts, but I remember it to this day. I've forgotten an awful lot of other gifts, but I remember Grandma's gifts while we were there in Hawaii. Well, then we moved from there to Alabama, and the one gift I can remember from Alabama was uh, I got a G.I. Joe. I got a G.I. Joe, and this G.I. Joe came with his own little boat, it actually had, a, actually had a little motor on the back. I think you could put a battery in, which I never did. I just had fun floating it on the water. And he had a rope ladder that he could climb with. I remember the rope ladder because I let one of my friends play with it, and he broke the thing. And so I, I can remember that. But I remember getting G.I. Joe. And then probably one of the next Christmases I remember is when I was in college. Um, when I was in college, I went down for my senior year to Florida, and that's where I met Len. But for that Christmas, during that Christmas break, um, I wanted to go and be with my family. And my mom and dad were going to, at the time they weren't in Alabama, they were up in New York, but they went back down to Alabama to visit other family, and I met them there and had Christmas there. Now, what I remember about the gifts there is I didn't get any. <laughs> really, and, and that, that was a good thing, though. I didn't get any Christmas gifts except for the idea that mom and dad was paying for me to meet them there, and then they took me back to New York with them for, for the rest of the holiday, and then they paid for me to go home. That, that's all I got. I didn't actually get any gifts, and yet it was one of the most fun Christmases I ever had. It was a lot of fun. I remember I stayed with my brother and his wife and daughter, and the daughter wouldn't leave me alone. She was like three years old at the time, and I remember my brother kept telling her to lick her finger and stick it in my ear because I was sleeping on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she just kept bugging me. Uh, but, but it was, what a wonderful time. I really loved it. My, my niece, by the way, is now a nurse. She's in her early 30s. And uh, she, they're just a hoot. They're, they're fun to be around. But, uh, but I remember that Christmas. And, and another important thing about that Christmas is uh, when I come back from Christmas is when Lynn and I started dating. And then we got engaged that spring and so forth. So that was... Uh, that was a fun time. She wasn't even here to hear that. Can you believe that? I would have told her that. What I want to talk about, though, as far as Christmas gifts, I want to talk about some deeper gifts. And we did start looking at some of the gifts that God's given us uh, through Christmas. Remember last week we talked about acceptance, the idea that we have been given acceptance by God. And, and what that primarily got at last week was the idea that God has accepted us. Remember there was a quote there that you may have accepted Jesus into your life, but you could only do that because Jesus accepted you. God has accepted us, and the reason he's accepted us is because of the fact that he sent Jesus at Christmas to be born and to walk among us, but it's really what he did at Easter, wasn't it? When he died on the cross and rose again from the grave, he bore our sins. And because he bore our sins, I don't have to earn my way into God's presence. I don't have to be good enough for God to enjoy. And it certainly doesn't depend on my uh, self-worth. I don't have to try to convince myself that I was worth it for Jesus because the Bible says I wasn't worth it for Jesus. What the Bible says is that Jesus was of such great love that he did it for me anyway. And he provided for me. So now I can stand before God accepted in his presence because God sees Jesus' righteousness, not my sins. And so that was what we had talked about last week. Well, this week, the gift that I want to look at is the gift of security. Have you thought about security? There are some similarities between security and acceptance. But I believe acceptance, uh, we're going to see the difference between those as time goes on. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get into our study. 
Father, thank you for the Christmas season. Thank you for the, the wonder of it. Thank you for the, just the, the amazing parts of the story. And, and of course, we get to enjoy the songs about that. The, the angels, the shepherds, Bethlehem, um, the, the Virgin Mary, all of those things. We get to enjoy the, the beauty of that. And yet, Father, uh, you've given us even deeper things. And I pray that you'd help us to uh, appreciate today the idea that you have made it so that we can, in fact, be secure before you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, let's look at the, the need for security. Why do, we, why do we need security? Well, as we get into that, what, how would you define security? Have you thought about that? How would you define that? Well, I actually went online and I looked at a number of uh, online dictionaries about what the idea of security means. I also went online and, and went to several uh, psychological counseling type sites and looked at things they had to say about security and so forth. But the definitions, they, they all started sounding the same as it went on. But the word secure actually means a number of different things. It can be a noun, it can be an adjective, it can be a verb, and you just see a number of different ways that it comes out. Well, first of all, let me just read a few things that I found. First of all, the idea of secure is as a noun, it means you are safe and protected. I guess that would be an adjective, not a noun possibly, but, but it means that you are safe and protected. For instance, the fact that your money is secure in a bank means that your, your money is safe and protected. It can also have to do with feelings, not just uh, the fact of security, but your feelings as well. If you have good friends that support you and, and that you know that they, that they love you, well, then that can make you feel secure. Well, secure can also be a verb. Think about the idea of securing your, your if you own a sailboat, if you're securing the sails. On your sailboat, what do you do? You're tying them down, you're lashing them so that they're going to be safe and protected. And where they at? That's that's part of being secure. Well, I found some others. Uh, here was one site that gave me a whole list of a number of things. It says uh, to be secure or, or secure is first of all free from danger or attack, free from risk of loss. That means you're safe. Free from fear, anxiety, or doubt. Uh, it means not likely to fail. That it's stable. It can mean that it's reliable or dependable. And this one I like. This is kind of a newer uh, one. It means safe from unauthorized interception by others. Think about your internet connection. And you've got your passwords and, and things like that to protect you. You're safe from unauthorized interception by others. Uh, as a verb, it can mean to guarantee payment. It can mean to bring about or to, to affect something. It can mean to obtain or get possession of. So that's all part of being secure. Secure, it's something that will be permanent, especially after some effort. Or, or a lot of effort in some cases. Well, those are all definitions that we'd put in our earthly realm. But what if we took those definitions and we put them in a spiritual realm? As far as how are we, as far as being secure before God? Well, let, let, let's think about that for a minute because we have real emotional issues. A, a lot of us uh, can have a lot of emotional issues when it deals with being secure. Think about psychological issues. You, well, some of us have insecurities. I don't have any insecurities, I know, but you probably have some. No, that's not true. I, I do from time to time. We can be insecure in our relationships, either relationships with some of your friends. Uh, maybe it's a relationship with your spouse. Maybe it's a relationship with, with other people that you have in your life. We can be insecure with our performance. You know, how's my performance at work? Am, am, I, really, am I really doing the job? Am I really doing what's right? Uh, am, I, am I causing this venture to fail? Or, or what? You know, if something's not quite right, that, that's work insecurity. Uh, you can, your performance at home. Am I a good dad? Am I a good mom? Am I a good spouse? Am I a good provider? Am I, am I good at uh, taking care of the things around the house that need to be taken care of? Well, whatever that would be, uh, we can have securities or uh, insecurities with those things. Think about fears. Uh, what type of phobias do you have? Now, I know in here most of us would say we don't have any phobias, but guess what? I've been here 22 years now, and I've been around a lot of you. Some of you have some real phobias, right? I remember making a joke one time about uh, germophobia, and the funny thing was is uh, several people didn't laugh, and I thought, oh, I started watching. I realized, well, they're all germophobes. That's part of the problem. <laughs> See, I grew up as a, as a kid. I was the youngest of five kids. If I was a germaphobe, I would have never survived. 
You know what I mean? I mean, I just had to take what came. I had to sleep where there was a place to sleep. Uh, and, and food, too. You know, I, the older brothers could get there before me if I worried about did they touch it or did they not. I'd, I'd be in trouble. So, yeah, you got to be careful. Some people have phobias of heights. Some people have phobias of spiders. Think about that. Uh, we could go on and on and on with some of those things. Uh, some of us have fears about the future. Um, are my finances secure? And am I going to have the finances that I need? How are we going to pay this bill? That sort of a thing. Uh, what about my health? Is my health going to hold up? Am I going to be all right there? Or, or is it only going to get worse? Uh, you know, and I admit, as I get older, I think more about those sorts of things. So, yeah, we can have all kinds of things that make us feel insecure. But what about if you took those feelings and some of those definitions we've already looked about, and if you put them in the spiritual realm, what kind of uh, phobias would we have? Spiritually speaking, what kind of insecurities would we have, spiritually speaking? Let me give an example. Think about your salvation. Am I good enough to be saved? I just saw something. What was it? I just saw this the other day. I didn't write this down in my notes. But someone actually, oh, I know what it was. It was on Facebook. And somebody had a thing on Facebook where they were trying to decide, am I going to go to heaven or not? And they had a whole chart and everything. And basically it was the old scale thing. You know, uh, do my does my good outweigh my bad? And I happen to know the person that put it up there, and they said, "Well, I did nine hundred and something uh, uh, bad things, but I did three thousand and something good things." And they thought, "Well, that must be plenty." Good. And I thought, "No, I should put a note on here because, listen, buddy, who are you talking about? You're not talking about you, because uh, those numbers would wouldn't match up quite as well as you're trying to give them. But it'd be the same with me. And but am I good enough? Well, actually, we looked at that last week when we talked about um, when we talked about the idea of acceptance. And you know what? You're not good enough. Your scale would never measure up. You would never have more good than bad if God allowed that anyway. It, it just wouldn't happen. I certainly wouldn't. I don't, and none of us would. You're, you're never going to have more good than bad because there's so much more about us that we don't realize is sinful. There's so much more about us that, that, that has put a, a wedge between us and our creator. We're just, we're just not good enough. But remember we talked about it last week. That problem has been solved because it's not your good enough that's going to get you into heaven. It's Jesus' good enough that's going to get us into heaven. And Jesus' Jesus's righteousness has been given to all of us who have received Christ as Savior. Our sins have been forgiven. He paid the penalty that God said would be the penalty when Adam and Eve first sinned. He did that for us. So now our sins have been forgiven. And now it's not so much that I'm good enough, but Jesus is good enough. And he's my Savior. And he's given that good enough to me. And so that's taken care of. But what about other issues that go along with that? What about are you good enough to hang on to your salvation? Are you good enough to keep it? You know what I mean? Okay, uh, Jesus provided for me. I've got salvation. I've been given the gift of eternal life. But now what happens if I start sinning? I'm trying not to walk too far away from this thing so I can get it on, on record. What happens if I start sinning? What happens if I really go over the deep edge? What then? And am I still going to be able to uh, go to heaven? Uh, can, I, can I lose it somehow? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, what about other things that I need to feel a little secure? And what about the cares of this life? Uh, will I see God's care in my life? Uh, how can I trust him that he's going to continue to care for me? He has made some promises in that area, hasn't he? And so we need to consider some of those. Well, through the Christmas story, let me just say this. God has given us security. God has given us reasons to feel secure. And I want to talk about some of those reasons. Uh, the, 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 the next thing is that think about God's provision. God has provided security. Well, how has he done that? Well, he's done it in a number of ways. But one of the things he's, he's done it to help us feel secure is think about the promises God has made that God has fulfilled. And the Christmas story is a perfect story that points that out. I, I had mentioned if you had turned to Matthew uh, chapter 1, uh, in this part of the story, you can see a number of things where God has made promises in the past and he has kept every single one of them just think about it can you think of one promise that God has made that he hasn't kept now you can probably think of some promises that God has made that he didn't keep them the way you would like them to be kept 
But God has still kept them. And in the Christmas story, we see that. In the book of Matthew, when Matthew's giving his Christmas story in chapters 1 and chapter 2, the main idea that Matthew's trying to get across is that God has made a bunch of promises through his prophets. There's been prophecies that he's given, and God has kept them. And that's how he's pointing these out. Uh, let me just point a couple to you if you're in um, Matthew chapter 1. In uh, chapter 1, verse 23, Matthew says this, um, he says, verse 22, actually, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, that was a prophecy that was made back in Isaiah chapter 7. And Matthew's pointed it out. God kept his promise. In uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says, so they said to him when, when, the, when they were asking where the child was going to be born, uh, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. By the Lord causing it so that Mary and Joseph ended up in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. He fulfilled that prophecy that came from Micah chapter 5. In uh, chapter 2, verse 15, it says, uh, let me read verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother, this is Joseph, by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. And that actually comes from Hosea chapter 11. In uh, chapter 2, verse 18, it keeps going. They're talking about the children that are going to be killed in the Bethlehem area. And there was a prophecy about that. Verse 18, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her ch children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now that's a sad one. That's one we wished had to come true, but it did. And God prophesied, or he had it prophesied so long before that those things were going to happen. In uh, chapter 2, verse 23, is another one. As it uh, moves forward, it says, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now that's actually a harder one to figure out where that's actually said. There's a number of places that it could be, but one possibility is from Psalm chapter 22, uh, where it's talking about uh, the Messiah. Who was to come. So you see, uh, Matthew's pointing out that God has made promises and God is in the business of fulfilling those promises, and he did. Luke's story in Luke chapter 1, 2, and 3 points out the same thing. It points out the fact that God has had a plan, and the, the Israelites knew it from a long time before, where all the prophets were talking about the Messiah who was going to come. And you see it especially when um, the angel goes and tells Mary that she's going to have a child. And then Mary goes to Elizabeth's house, which is her cousin, and Mary has what's called uh, Mary's Magnificat. It's actually like a song or, or, or where she kind of broke out into uh, saying a number of things, and it's it's recorded there. And one of the things that's recorded there, she's talking about the fact that, God, you said you were going to do these things, and here you are doing them. Zechariah and Elizabeth had the same thing. Uh, when Zacharias was struck dumb because the angel told him they were going to have a child who ended up being John the Baptist. And uh, Zacharias, after the child was born, he breaks out and prays as well. And he's saying the same thing. Lord, you said you're going to do these things, and here you are doing them. Here you are. They're coming to pass. They're fulfilling. The actual Christmas story itself, think about all the things that happened in this story. In order for it to take place, God had to orchestrate it all. And my point in all this is that God did orchestrate them. God did cause the things to come to pass just as they should. Not only in theory. I mean, we can talk in theory, right? There's all kinds of, of theory, not just our conservative theories. There's liberal theories. There's, there's all kinds of other ideas on how things should be. But God didn't just deal in theory. God actually st went down and started acting in fact. He started doing the very things that needed to be done for this story to unfold. Think about Mary and her pregnancy. Well, first of all, he had, to, he had to have a virgin as it was prophesied that there would be. And then God came and worked specifically in her life. God brought the angel to come and talk to her. And then God caused her to, to be able to leave for a time from her family and go be with her older cousin Elizabeth and her husband Zacharias, who was also having a baby at this time. God caused all those things to unfold that way. Then we see Joseph, and you get that in Matthew's story especially, where Joseph had all these concerns. I mean, here he was about to be married. Married, and this this girl that he was going to marry is pregnant. He knows it wasn't his. 
And especially if you watch, remember the latest nativity movie we've seen a couple times here at church? Joseph was concerned because he wanted to be an upright man. And he wanted to protect his reputation as an upright man as well. And so he was worried about all those things. But God caused it to work out just right. God appeared to Joseph and told him, look, don't be afraid. This is what I'm actually doing. And so the story unfolds as it should. Zachariah and Elizabeth's circumstances unfolded it just as it needed to be unfolded. So you see, God was working in all these plans. And if God can intricately put together all the details here in this story, if he can do that, we can trust him to put together the details in our lives, can't we? And a lot of times we worry about that. We get, we get so afraid. We, we think, uh, how, how is this going to happen? Well, what, what's God going to actually do? Or, or a lot of times we just forget about God. What, what am I going to do? How is this going to work out? But if God could work out the details in their lives so that his plan unfolded exactly as it was supposed to unfold, why can't he do the same thing in your life? And the fact of the matter is he can. The fact of the matter is he does. Look back over your life. Yeah, we all have things that, like we said earlier, didn't work out the way we wanted them to. We all have things that we don't understand why they happen that way. But as time goes on, as we get older, and especially as we grow in wisdom, we look back and we see, you know, I, I, I think I can see what God was trying to do there. I think I can see how God was preparing me to be where I need to be today. Remember the, the story of Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata, and how she was paralyzed as a teenager in a swimming accident? And then uh, she had to go through all of the difficulties of, of, of being a paraplegic. But as she was growing and as she was getting a little bit older and she started focusing more on what God was doing than what she wanted, at one point she came across a, a, a particular person and she said, I can honestly say that I'd rather be here in this wheelchair knowing that God is in charge and working out his plan than I, than I would if, if I wasn't in this wheelchair. And she was, she was willing to accept those things. She could see that God had provided and put her in a position to do things that she otherwise would have never have been able to do, to affect people and minister to people in ways she never could have done. And so she saw that. Well, we see the same thing here, and it comes out as we see the story, as a God is carrying out his promises and, and putting feet to it and making it real and making it in flesh. God carries those things out. Well, it got me thinking about another concept here. What about our salvation? What about uh, some of God's uh, promises concerning salvation? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes can have everlasting life. But we play around with that concept sometimes. Sometimes when we think, okay, I remember, I remember when I received Christ as my Savior, but what about now? Uh, Lord, I'm not good enough to be saved. Lord, Lord, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not meeting up with your expectations. And, and, and I get worried about that. And I'm worried about did I lose my salvation or not? Well, I, I want to talk about the concept of eternal security. Uh, the fact that we are eternally secure. That's, that's a theological term. You won't see that term specifically spelled out that way in the Bible. But it has to do with the idea of can we lose our salvation or can we keep it? Now, to be fair, there are Christians that would disagree with me on this, on this particular thing. There are certain segments of Christianity that believe you can lose your salvation. But as you look at the scriptures, as you study the scriptures, is that really true? Can you lose your salvation? And I don't believe you can. First of all, just go back and think about John 3.16 that was just said. Uh, Whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. All right, you believe Jesus, you become a believer, you have everlasting life, and then now you suddenly sin and now you don't have everlasting life. What was so everlasting about that? It wasn't very everlasting, was it, if now that you're losing it? So just the, the logical aspect of that, think it through. But there's a number of places in the scriptures that share with us the idea that once you are saved, once you receive Christ as your Savior, you are secure in your salvation. And I want to look at a couple of those. I don't have enough time for us to read all of these, so I will just, uh, I will just talk about a couple of them. But in John chapter 10 is where Jesus is talking, and he's actually talking to a group of, of unbelievers, the Sadducees and Pharisees. And he says, the reason you can't hear what I'm saying is because you're not one of my sheep. But he said, my sheep, I know them, and they know me. And that's where he makes a statement that he said, uh, they, are, they will never be plucked from my Father's hand. 
Okay, that in itself is a great promise. Now, people who don't believe that you can uh, keep your salvation forever, some of them uh, would believe that you might not be able to be plucked out of his hand, but you can get out of his hand and walk away on your own if you want. But that doesn't seem to be the case when you look at the rest of the scriptures here. I'm going to turn to uh, Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is talking about this very same thing. And he's just talking about some of the concepts that happen in salvation. Look in Romans 8. I'm going to begin at verse 29. He says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And glorified is the idea that one day we're going to be in heaven, made right with the Lord. Um, you follow that whole process through, there's no room for failure. If God is beginning the process, it says that God is going to do these things. God's going to finish the process that he began. And that's what we see. Over in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, this is actually a longer passage, uh, verses 3 through 14. You see all three members of the Trinity being involved in helping us to make sure that our salvation is secure. In, uh, in verses 3 through 6, we, you see that the Father planned this. The Father put this whole plan together. Salvation, and even from the from the beginnings of, of the world, he planned that you were going to be one of his children if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. And he, he planned that. And then in verses 7 through 12, we see what Jesus had to do to secure that plan. And and the things, of course, that he did was he, he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. And, and therefore, you receive his righteousness because he received your sinfulness. And then in verses 13 and 14, we see that the Holy Spirit sealed the deal. The Holy Spirit caused all these things to happen and to stay in place. And it says he is the seal of our salvation. And, and in, in a biblical sense, this is a guarantee. That, that the Holy Spirit is guarantee, guaranteeing that. So you see a number of biblical passages that talk that just don't leave the, um, the idea that we could lose our salvation. Now, what about from a practical standpoint? And I think this is where the real struggle comes in. Um, most of us who believe in this idea of eternal security don't use this phrase, but people who don't believe it will throw the phrase at us. I've had a number of my, my friends here in town that go to other churches that don't hold to this. They will, it seems like they always bring this up to me, and they'll use the phrase, once saved, always saved. And you know what really bugs them about that whole idea is they'll say, what about someone who made a profession of faith? They, they then got involved in church, and, and they appear to be walking with the Lord, but someday they turn away from their faith, and they walk away from it, and they start doing dastardly things. They start doing all kinds of stuff that believers are said not supposed to be able to do. And they say, how can you hold that idea that once saved, always saved? And they get the impression that what we're saying is, is we're saying, well, they shouldn't worry about it if they're saved anyway, so I guess that's settled. That, but that's not what we're saying. That once saved, always saved is kind of a, uh, again, that's one of those phrases that I wouldn't use. What I would use is this, and I believe this is more biblical. Once saved, proven saved. In other words, if a person does in fact get saved, as their life goes on, it's going to be borne out in their life. You're going to see proof of their salvation. That means the opposite is also true. Once someone makes a profession of being saved, if they're not really saved, you're going to see proof of that eventually that they weren't really saved. You're going to see proof of that eventually that they are, they're, they're not having anything to do with the things of God. They don't want the things of God. And what, what it proves is their faith never was genuine in the first place. Now, I know that this gets hard. It's a hard concept to see because we all know people that, that as we've grown up, they were involved in the church all their life. They were doing things in the church. They served in the church. They, they may have even led someone to the Lord, quote unquote. You know, But then later on, something happens and they just turn away from God and just walk away from it all. And, and, and that makes it hard for us to fathom all that and, and to weed through all that. But I have to believe that what the scriptures seem to be saying is that they're just proving that their faith never was genuine in the first place. By the way, when I became a Christian, the guy who invited me to the youth group that I went to, the guy that got me most interested in going, he, he's not a believer today. And, but yet God used him anyway. 
I mean, God can use whatever source he wants. God he can use a tree to cause people to look to him. God can use a rock to cause people to look to him. So I'm not so much concerned about that, that idea. But, but again, the truth of the matter here, here is, is we talk about eternal security. The, the, the phrase that people would use for it is called perseverance of the saints. And what that means is if someone truly is a saint, they will persevere in their faith. Now, that's a bit of a misnomer as well. Because the Bible doesn't show anywhere that it's because of anything this person does that makes them persevere. But rather, it's what God does in their life that makes them persevere. So maybe a better phrase, instead of perseverance of the saints, would be perseverance of the Lord in the life of the saints. You see? It's God's work, what God is doing. And, and that's what will help us to remain in our faith. And so, once saved, proven saved is true. That brings up some practical implications, doesn't it? What about those people that we know, and maybe maybe some of them are your children. Maybe some of them are other people that you know that, that made a profession of faith when they were little. You know, we were trying to be good parents. We were trying to walk them along. We were trying to help them. And when they were six, seven, eight years old, they prayed to receive Jesus as their Savior. But then as they became teenagers and young adults, they never walked with the Lord. What's the implication? The implication is not that their faith was real. The implication is that their faith wasn't real to begin with. I've mentioned a book a couple times, I think, here called... Um, what, what is that book actually called? Shepherding the Child's Faith. What was that? Shepherding the Child's Faith. No, it's called Al Already Gone. That's what, it, that's what it was called, but it was written by the same guy, Already Gone. And I think it was written by the man that was speaking here about the Christmas tree, Paul Trick. He's a, he's a Christian biblical counselor. And, uh, and what he's saying in that is, is we, all, we ask the question, why is it that so many kids, it seems like when they leave the house and they go off to college or do whatever, that they walk away from the faith? Well, his whole contention is they were already gone to begin with. Their faith never was genuine. Yeah, while well, they were at home and they were with mom and dad, they were in church, they were doing all the things that they needed to do. They talked the talk that they needed to talk. And they probably even themselves thought that that's what faith was all about. But then when they got out and went on their own, they fall away. Well, why do they fall away? It's not that they lost their salvation. It's that they're showing they didn't have it in the first place. And that's the implication. Because if you look at these passages we've already read, and you look at other passages uh, also dealing with this topic, you see that God says what he starts, he's going to finish. God says when it comes to salvation, this is what he's doing. And he's going to see it through. And he's going to cause them to, to truly be a person who's walking in faith. Eventually. Now, does, does that mean that we won't have any struggles? Does that mean we won't have uh, any problems along the way? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. Um, so will we backslide? Yeah, there's times when we'll backslide. I've backslid. There's been times when I'm going along walking with the Lord, and for whatever reason, I, I start living in sin or whatever that type of sin might be. And, uh, and yeah, I, I may backslide. Well, then what happens? Uh, the, the issue is, for a true believer, they're not going to stay in that backslidden position. God's going to work in their life somehow, some way, where eventually they're going to turn back from that. If they never turn back from it, you have right, you have reason to question their salvation. But they're going to turn back. In, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, God talks about the fact that he's a father to them. And, and God says in verse 7 of chapter 12, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. In other words, if you are truly a believer, you're truly a son of God, and you start walking in sin, God's going to spank you. And it says that he will spank you. Now, the next verse is important because the next verse goes on and says, but if you are without chastening, you are illegitimate and not a son at all. Think about this. Who's the most miserable people on the earth? An unbeliever walking in sin or a believer walking in sin? You can bet your bottom dollar a believer walking in sin is by far more miserable than an unbeliever who's walking in sin. Why? An unbeliever is walking in sin. That's just who they are. But an unbeliever, that's not who they're supposed to be, and their heavenly Father will chastise them. So it is true, sometimes as believers, we can be more miserable than when we were unbelievers. But the reason is because God's spanking us. The question is, is how am I going to respond to it? Am I going to respond to him or not? I need to respond to him. And, 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 and if he's spanking me, then I need to come to the place where I repent of those things and turn back to a walk with him. That's evidence that your salvation is genuine. And that's evidence that, that your faith is real and you have the gift of eternal life.
Now, we can also go and talk about other things, not just salvation, but other things that God has promised to do for us, like taking care of us. Like in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, um, the, the scriptures say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we know that God is going to take care of us. But I, I just got stuck on that whole thing about salvation and our eternal security. I believe that is the most wonderful gift that God has given us. And, and we, have, we have reactions. How are we going to react to that? Uh, we can have negative responses, and, and you would expect that from the world. The world will negatively respond. I went to our church's uh, Facebook page this last week, and I was looking at some different things. And I noticed somebody had responded to something on there. And I went and looked, and this person was just mocking us. Just making fun of us, and they were talking about Jesus as a big, basically a genie in a bottle and a big myth. And he was trying to talk, you know, trying to tell a whole funny story about, oh, they're, they're just kind of mocking us. You know what? It didn't bother me that much. I kind of expect that. That's what I'd expect a person who's not a believer to think, because to them it does look just like that. It does look like a bunch of gobbledygook. It does look like a bunch of fairy tales. I understand that. <laughs> And that's how you'd expect a, uh, an unbeliever to respond. But what about believers? Sometimes believers struggle with these things. And sometimes believers have a hard time trusting that God is in control, trusting that God has made their salvation secure. Why is that? Well, it could be, first of all, maybe they don't understand the scriptures. You go to uh, 1 John chapter 5, and in 1 John 5, John says, These things have been written so that you might know that you have eternal life. So, so maybe the person doesn't know enough scripture and they're kind of at the whims of their immature thinking in that matter. That, that could be the whole thing. Um, but, but they need to understand. They need to trust the Lord. Well, well, how do we respond properly? How do we have a faith response? Well, I think we need to do what the psalmist did. Many times the psalmist, there was David was a psalmist in a number of them, or other psalmists that wrote. And what they would quite often do when you read some of those psalms is you see they begin with a problem. There's some sort of a problem. David was really good about this. He wasn't afraid to tell the Lord what he thought. He'd start with a problem. He'd say, Lord, why are you letting this happen? Lord, why is everything falling apart? And then about midway through the psalm, David starts reflecting on what God has done. Wait a minute. Look what God has always done. Look how God has always provided. Look what God said he was going to do in the past and actually did those things. And then by the end of the psalm, David had counseled himself out of his discouragement and into a sense of trust. And into a sense of praise. We need to be the same way. Especially as we think about how God has provided for us. We need to understand God has given us every reason to be secure. So when I go through those times and I'm feeling insecure. And by the way, I think all of us can go through those times. Sometimes. When I'm going through those times when I'm feeling insecure. I need to do what the psalmist did. And I need to stop the complaining for a moment. And rehearse what God has actually done. And rehearse what all the things that, that I've seen God fulfill in my life. And understand, you know what? He's going to get me through this as well. And then I'll find that I can spend time praising him. I can spend time trusting him. And I don't have to be locked away in the pit of despair for a while. The reason I chose uh, to do this during Christmas time is I think God's Christmas story is a great example of God's provision. God said he was going to provide for us. He was going to provide for the nation of Israel, and I think he still is going to. Um, he, he's provided for the sins of the world. We certainly see how that has been done through the Lord Jesus. And, and, and it's all because he sent him in the first place. He actually took the practical steps beyond the theory of it all and actually put him as a baby on this earth that could grow into a man and, and live the way he lived and die the way he died. And that's what the Christmas story brings to us. Well, think about some of those definitions I gave of security back in the beginning. Uh, one definition was safe and protected. <clears throat> Don't we have that, spiritually speaking? Another definition, free from the risk of loss. Another one is safe from unauthorized interception by others. You know, God has put a password on you and the devil doesn't know the password and he can't get at you. And you know what? Your boss can't get at you. Your co-workers can't get at you. Your antagonistic family members can't get at you. You are safe from unauthorized interception by others. It's something that will be permanent, especially after a lot of effort. Who's done the effort in all of this? God has. It's about God's effort, not about your effort. Yeah, I need to respond to God. Yeah, I need to walk with God. But I walk with God because I want to walk with God and want to do what's right, not because I'm afraid I'll go to hell if I don't. You see the difference? I'm not going to go to hell because Jesus has provided for my salvation. 
Now I'm going to try to walk with him because I want to be pleasing to him. But it's all about what God has done, not about what you have to done, and not about what you have to do. If you know the Lord is your Savior, you are very secure. And we're going to spend eternity together in heaven one day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for providing for us through the Lord Jesus. Thank you for uh, helping us to see that uh, our salvation is secure. You did the work. You provided it for us. The Lord Jesus has accomplished the work. And now the Holy Spirit is the seal upon our lives that guarantees that uh, we are secure. May we live in that security, Lord, and not, not be struggling with the trust issues, not be struggling with the, all the doubts and the fears that just make life miserable. Instead, help us to enjoy your presence and enjoy trusting that you have made it all secure for us. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen.